Good evening. I'm Tricia Craig, Vice President of Engagement here at Yale and US College. And it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this evening's very special panel on an era of globalization, one that began more than 450 years ago. The Manila galleon trade between Latin America and Asia, particularly the Philippines, is fascinating on its own terms. And I'm looking forward to hearing our esteemed speakers. But it also takes on special relevance this year as the Pacific Alliance, the trade bloc formed by Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and Peru, prepares to welcome Singapore, its first Asian member, ushering a new modern era of trade between the two regions. Fitting for such an event, I'm really pleased to see a global and enthusiastic audience and want to extend a special welcome to those of you tuning in from the Philippines, from Latin America, all across Southeast Asia, as well as Friends of the Museums. I think you're in for a real treat tonight. I also want to thank our co-sponsors in the diplomatic community here in Singapore. The idea for tonight's event was suggested by their excellencies, Ambassador Agustin Garcia Lopez Loesa of Mexico, Ambassador Carlos Vasquez of Peru, and Ambassador Joseph Del Mariap of the Philippines. I'm very grateful for their help in putting together tonight's session, and we will hear a few concluding remarks from them at the end of the evening. Before I turn the proceedings over to our moderator, I have a couple of housekeeping announcements. First, we ask that you please do not take screenshots or recordings of tonight's session. A recording of the event will be available on the college's YouTube channel. And second, we very much welcome your questions, and I imagine there will be many. So please enter any questions you might have in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and the panelists will try to answer as many as they can. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's moderator, my Yale and US colleague, Professor Matthew Reeder. Prof Reeder is an historian of early modern Southeast Asia and its global interconnections. We are so fortunate that he joined the college earlier this year. I will now leave the session in his good hands. Matt, over to you. Hey, thank you, Tricia. Um, I'm so glad to have the uh, chance to moderate a discussion with such a fantastic panel um, of experts. Um, and also to know that there's so many, uh, so many people who are joining us uh, from all over the world in the audience. And so even though I can't see you, it's exciting to know that you're, that you're here. Um, for nearly 250 years, from 1564 to 1815, um, huge sailing ships laden with valuable goods crisscrossed the Pacific Ocean, linking Manila in the Philippines with Acapulco in what's now Mexico. In each direction, the journey could take well over four months, and storms and shipwrecks were persistent risks. But the profits could be enormous. Many merchants and Spanish colonists drew wealthy from, the, uh, from this trade, and elites on both sides of the ocean enjoyed access to imported luxury goods. More modest, cheaper products and produce also found their ways to the markets of Manila and Acapulco. Um, but the importance of this trans-Pacific connection um, was not limited to these two cities. The goods loaded onto the galleons were often sourced from far afield. Porcelain, spices, lacquerware, cotton, silk, and many other things were brought to Manila from China, Japan, Southeast Asia, and the Indian Ocean Rim. Galleons returning to Manila from Acapulco carried silver and edible plants from the Americas, as well as luxury goods from Europe. In other words, the reach of the galleon trade went far beyond the shores of the Pacific Ocean. Nor was the importance of the trans-Pacific connection limited just to trade. The galleons facilitated Spanish rule over diverse far-flung territories, which of course came with its own set of problems and injustices. At the same time, certain members of colonial society on both ends of the ocean felt intimately connected, culturally as well as politically. So we're very lucky to have four experts uh, with us today who can help us better understand um, not just the economics of this trans-Pacific link, uh, but also its cultural, material, and political implications. Dr. Cuauhtémoc Villamar will speak to us about the structure of the trade. Dr. Raquel Reyes will discuss its impact on Manila. Dr. Florina Capistrano-Baker will share her research on how Manila was linked to other places in Asia. And Mr. Clement On will talk to us about uh, a piece of material culture related to the trade. So I'll, I'll introduce each speaker more properly just before their talk. Um, we'll begin with uh, Dr. Cuauhtémoc Villamar. On his retirement from uh, the Mexican Foreign Service, Dr. Villamar earned a PhD in history from National University of Singapore. Um, his book, Portuguese Merchants in the Manila Galleon System, uh, just came out this year. 
Uh, today, he will introduce us to the big picture history of the galleon trade. He'll help us see the patterns and the structures of this trans-Pacific connections over four centuries, uh, all in 10 minutes. <laughs> so, Kwatemu, please. Thank you very much. I will share my screen to start the, the presentation. Um, it is an honor to participate in this colloquium uh, to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the Pacific Alliance. It will like, I would like to, to thank the Yale and US College for the organization of this event and the support of the embassies of Mexico, Peru, and the Philippines in Singapore. My contribution this, uh, to this co uh, academic conversation has to do with the long history. I want to propose a critical perspective on the importance of trade across the Pacific Ocean beyond its economic, uh, economic as aspects. I will refer to some of the demographic and biological effects of this interaction, and briefly to the cross-cultural exchange generated over centuries of relation. Conclusively, it's a reference to the historical contact across the Pacific and the current challenges we face in achieving key targets uh, of sustainable development. The Manila Galleon system, um, let's talk about the Manila Galleon system. The Manila Galleon initiated with a somehow soft opening in 1565 with the return journey of the San Pedro Galleon from Cebu to Acapulco. This voyage was the first European voyage west to east through the Pacific named the Tornaviaje. First, five years later, with the foundation of Manila, in 1571, the route was used regularly almost every year with relatively few uh, incidents uh, until 1815, when it was interrupted by the War of Independence of Mexico. Um, the Manila Galleon was more than a mechanism of exchange of merchandise. It was a system of trade under the rule of the Spanish monarchy. It was established as a crown monopoly, but with the contribution of multiple participants in Asia, the Americas, and Europe. In fact, the trade in the Pacific was connected with the exchange across the Atlantic. The particular trade of the trading was uh, uh, established, uh, the particular trace of this trading system established in the Pacific aimed to ensure the legality of the transactions predictability of transportation and security of trade. The system was particularly modified during, uh, partially modified during the 18th century with the intention to create a, a charter company on the style of the BOC of the East Asian um, uh, English um, uh, um, Indian company, focusing on profit. However, maintaining its main regularity the, the regulatory characteristics of the Manila Galleon continue. Academic studies explain from the economic point of view the motivations of this link across the Pacific. Silver from the Americas received the attention of China because its monetary system was experiencing a deep transformation at the end of the Ming Dynasty. The partial opening of the Chinese trade in 1567 and the introduction in 1572 of a new tax system in China based on silver encouraged the trade with foreigners. There has been much discussion about China's central role in the world economy at that time. Evidently, the fluctuation of silver supplies and prices, particularly of grains, could have been the cause of the fall of the Ming Dynasty leaving the foreign Qing rule in 1644. Another element that can be can uh, to consider is the determination of a Spanish crown to keep separate the two viceroyalties of the Americas. Uh, Peru well, Timo, can you, uh, sorry to interrupt, but can you press play uh, because the slides are very small? Yeah, it's true. <laughs> okay, well. thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. So the Spanish crown tried to keep separate the, Peru the Peruvian and, and the New Spain viceroyalty, the most important. Uh, uh, vice royalties in, in, in the Americas. That happened to be the two leading producers of silver of the world. The Spanish crown was perfectly clear 
of the reality that a closer relation of the American kingdoms could displace the Atlantic uh, economy and eventually lead to the independence of the colonies. On the economic side, the system, we are talking about a system that provides the necessary stability to the commerce in a broad historical period of more than 200 years and the transformation of these societies. A new agricultural system emerged in the Americas, um, adapting local and European patterns during the 16th and 17th centuries. Together with the mining sector, the colonial economy became the core of a new type of social structure. There were several social downsides in the process, extremely dependency to silver production, financial failures in the Spanish crown, pillage of natural resources, and, and above all, the submission and poverty of the indigenous people. The Trans-Pacific connections went deeper than the exchange of silver of high-end Asian goods. The link in the Pacific was also a silent exchange of crops and knowledge that generally got un unnoticed. Uh, steady interlinkages between communities across the Pacific led to substantive changes in food consumption, clothing, and diverse forms of what we now call the material culture. Conspicuous consumption of the elites was imitated in customs and tastes by the general population. Uh, let's take a step back in time to explain the long-term history of the Manila Galleon system and consequences of trade, trans-Pacific trade in our society today. This is the idea of how the Manila Galleon in the Pacific was connected to the, to the Atlantic uh, trade. So the, uh, for two and a half, half centuries, the exchanges among distant populations had important effects on biological and demographical aspects. I propose two bits of information as a baseline for this approach. Exactly 500 years ago, in 1521, Ferdinand Magellan arrived to the Philippines the same year Hernán Cortés military forces participated in local indigenous wars in Mesoamerica. Magellan died uh, that year in, in Asia, while contests in the, in the Americas triggered a truly disturbing time in the local cultures, including in some cases, the war of extermination and the involuntary transmission of diseases. This has a consequence, evident consequence in the demographic trends of the 16th century that, um, that globalization had over different parts in, in Asia, the Americas and Europe. A recent study, scientific study by a group of uh, biologists, demography, uh, demographers, et cetera, Succinctly points out by 1492, uh, uh, approximately 60.5 million people live in the Americas. In Europe, 70 to 88 million. Uh, this, this graphic can explain better the proportions of population. Southeast Asia had uh, 23 million, approximately, and Africa, 50 million. It's easy to observe that the population density, according to the area in which this, each group participates, was uh, uh, quite different. The Americas, the population in the Americas, had, was exposed, more exposed to diseases than the rest of the world. The Eurasian people had instead developed immunity since the Middle Ages during the 14th century. The Black Death spread from Central Asia to Europe and China two centuries before. As a consequence of this epidemic shock, the America, the Americas, in the Americas, the population declined dramatically with a recovery until the 17th century. However, and this is the other part of the explanation, the biological side of this picture is different due to the remarkable adaptation of crops from the Americas, such as potato, yam, chili, peanuts, tomato, maize, corn, transplanted to Europe and to Asia during the 16th century with clear benefits to the nutrition of their populations. The potato helped to reduce famines in China and in Europe. In the case of China and Southeast Asia, food plants entered slowly 
even more than a century between the moment a product arrived and its adaptation to Asian soil, as well as the diffusion of methods and adaptation to consumption. The agriculture, agricultural process is not the domestication of nature, but the relationship of mutual cultivation, uh, of mutual cultivation between human societies and their biological environment. The, this is the process. So the, the, the thesis is that how the biology creates a new kind of population, a new kind of culture, the humans being developed thanks to this cooperative interrelation with nature, the dissemination of new crops, the cross-cultural exchange and the migration of peoples around the world indicate that the Manila Galleon was pivotal in what can be called the first globalization. The most important effects of the Manila trade was the human connection. Manila Galleon was a vehicle of culture. Think, think about the Spanish language, the arts and crafts, and the shared cooking traditions on both sides of the ocean. Nowadays, all Latin American societies have a drop of Asian culture. I will skip part of the explanation in terms of culture uh, um, and concretely uh, uh, the uh, material culture, because the three next panelists are excellent experts on these topics and they will develop more on this uh, element. So uh, uh, I want to conclude from an historical perspective and extract some experiences. To achieve a previsible, the, the system of the Manila uh, was to achieve a previsible and fair trading system. Um, nowadays, when we face globally different challenges like trade wars, for example, in the world economy, and we are struggling with, again, one more time, with the wars damaging pandemics in, in more than a century, the main demand of the participants in the international trade is to have a clear and forcible regulatory frame of trade. Today, we are looking for predictability of the global architecture that favors cooperation, exchange, and investment. A key challenge for economics, for econom economists is meeting the sustainable development goals. We have to interact more responsibly with the biological environment. The objective is to improve the living conditions of our populations. History shows that these goals are possible and we can draw a great deal of knowledge from the past experience. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you so much. Um, now we turn to uh, Dr. Raquel Reyes. Dr. Reyes earned her PhD at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. She's worked at numerous institutions, including the Royal Netherlands Institute of Southeast uh, Asian and Caribbean Studies, the University of California, Berkeley, and starting next year, the Science History Institute of Philadelphia. Her latest edited volume is called Art, Trade, and Cultural Me Mediation in Asia from 1600 to 1950. Dr. Reyes will help us see how these trans-Pacific connections transformed the port city of Manila. Over to you, please. Hello, um, good evening. I'm, I'm very glad to be here. Thank you very much, Matt, for this marvelous invitation. I'm delighted to meet my fellow panelists. Um, Pre-Hispanic Manila was known as Mainilad, with a population of 2,000 people. They were bound by blood, trade, and friendship to the Sultan of Brunei, and with neighboring Muslim centers spanning the Jalo Archipelago in southern Philippines, Borneo, Aceh at the northern tip of Sumatra, the Malaccas within the Indonesian archipelago, Malacca in the Malay Peninsula, and Petani in the southern region of Thailand. Chinese merchants arrived in trading junks laden with wares to do business with the coastal Malays. In 1571, the Spanish navigator Miguel Lopez de Legazpi established Manila as the Spanish colonial capital of the Philippine archipelago. Through the lucrative galleon trade, Manila became one of the wealthiest entrepôts in Asia. Although dominant as a regional trading node, Manila was administered by Mexico and under the command of Madrid. Manila was multifunctional, 
just as in Portuguese controlled Malacca and Dutch controlled Batavia, Manila was a hub for the storage, exchange and transshipment of goods in the process linking the economies of riverine and ocean transport. Manila was cosmopolitan, Port cities were a major source of livelihood and therefore were a major force for cosmopolitanization. Port cities also looked inward. Manila brought hinterland communities in touch with the wider world and wider circuits of trade, networks of exchange and information. What were the social and cultural effects of global trade on local contexts? Let us briefly consider a variety of fundamental areas, sartorial fashions and bodily sense, aesthetic and culinary tastes, in which imported goods and their consumption affected everyday sensibilities in Manila and beyond. Between late October and late April each year, ships from Japan brought cargoes of finely woven silks, decorated screens rendered in gilt and lacquerware. From Malacca, Bengal and Cochin, Portuguese ships arrived laden with spices, precious jewels, textiles ranging from thin cotton muslins to soft wools, Turkish and Persian tapestries and carpets. Boats from Siam, Cambodia and Borneo carried rhino horn, hide, hoof and teeth, intricately woven palm mats, sago and black glazed jars. Portuguese new Christian merchant investors dealt in spices, slaves, silks and cottons. From the mid 17th century, Armenian merchants from New Jolfa traded in Manila with high value merchandise from India and elsewhere. The majority of ships were from China. Around 20 to 30 arrived packed with exquisite things. In addition to silks were luxurious brocades, taffeta and damasks, musk and ivory, seed pearls, rubies and sapphires, fresh and preserved fruit, live animals, including buffalo and horses. Over three months in the year, from March to June, Manila's inhabitants and merchants engaged in feverish commercial activity. Money flowed into Manila's royal exchequer in dues and taxes. Dues of 3% were levied on merchandise from China, for example. A 10% tax on goods arriving in Acapulco was paid over to Manila in the form of a subsidy. By June and July, Japanese ships departed with the southwest winds on their return journey, loaded with the goods that they had exchanged. Chinese silks, mirrors, deer hides, gold, honey, palm liquor. The Portuguese ships set off with the northeast monsoon winds in January. A few ships from Siam and Cambodia made turnaround visits in the months of April, May and June. By the end of June, the great Manila galleon had been loaded with goods, including slaves, and was ready to sail from Acapulco with the first southwest winds. By 1620, the city's population stood at 41,400, of which 2,400 were Spaniards, 3,000 Japanese, 20,000 Filipinos, and 16,000 Chinese. Natives and other Asians were compelled to reside in extramural communities. Filipinos clustered along the Pasig River and the shore of Manila Bay in suburbs called Arabales. The Japanese who chose to remain in Manila, traders and professed Christian pilgrims, were assigned a small area and were ministered by the Franciscan religious order. The Chinese, known by the term Sangleas, or those who come to trade, were by far the largest of the Asian ethnic settlers. Segregated from Spaniards and natives, they were located outside the city walls and confined to a ghetto known as the Parian. Manila's population swelled during the trading season. Merchants, transient peddlers, crewmen and seamen converged in droves. The galleon trade introduced a host of new goods that took dressing up to a new level. Manileños pursued expensive material things that satisfied private sensuous desires. Olfactory choices enlarged. Fine camphor arrived from Borneo. Cambodian ships brought benzoin. A new, more luxurious perfume was introduced, mastic, an aromatic resin derived from the Mediterranean evergreen tree Pistachia lentiscus. Mastic was used to perfume hair and smelled like cedar, pine, and frankincense, woody, spicy, with a hint of citrus. Sartorial in innovations insinuated themselves. Ladies' stockings appeared, as did mantillas. 
lavishly embroidered shawls or wraps that came to be known as mantones de manila or panuelos filipinos de tapar. Japanese-inspired Chinese-made handheld fans, los abenicos chinos, of silk, paper, and lacquer, were intricately carved folding blades of bone, ivory, and mother of pearl were exported to Acapulco. Tagalog men folded and tucked striped cotton cloths around their legs and waists to form a garment akin to breeches. For the first time, button fastenings, some of solid gold, were added. Pockets appeared, a small one to hold money, a larger pocket carried a dagger. The ensemble was completed with three more remarkable additions, a hat, stockings and shoes. The city laid on sumptuous fiestas that celebrated the departure of the galleons to Acapulco when images of the Blessed Virgin and saints were petitioned to ensure the success of the voyage. A small statue of the Virgin carved from dark wood called the Nuestra Señora de la Paz y del Buen Viaje were brought from Acapulco in 1626 on the galleon ship El Almirante. She crossed the Pacific many times and was the patroness of the Manila galleons. Each safe return was a joyous occasion, lasting two days of fireworks, music and masses. The galleon trade stimulated the growth of a new artisanal cottage industry devoted to the manufacture of religious statuary for export and for local use. Invariably, the artists were Chinese from the Parian. Carved from bone and ivory, Marian images and those depicting the infant Christ were shipped to New Spain and beyond. Religious and secular priests enjoyed the same advantages as other Spanish traders and spent extravagantly Religious purchases for San Agustin Church in the early 17th century were solid gold chalices from Mexico studded with rubies and em emeralds. The interior of the vaulted church built in 1604 boasted gilded retablos and a magnificently carved and embellished pulpit with an inverted pineapple. The sheer scale and variety of trade ceramics entering Manila via the galleon trade was unparalleled in 1600, the sunken cargo of the ill-fated galleon, San Diego, included Thai earthenwares, glazed Maitaban stonewares from Pegu, massive so-called dragon jars from South China, and blue and white porcelains from China, from China and Vietnam. The cultural impact of trade ceramics in local societies was profound. Both lowland and upland communities in Luzon acquired Chinese porcelain jars, which along with rice fields, copper gongs and gold ornaments were a key component of ceremonial wealth and prestige. The arrival of galleon shipments of New World cattle was accommodated on arable lands that were given over to ranches and livestock raising. Horses were brought first from Mexico. By the late 17th century, their plentiful presence was noted in Luzon and Mindanao. New World botanical introductions were numerous and various. Vanilla, peppers, peanuts and pineapples, sweet potatoes, maize, medicinals and textile plants. Tobacco made its first appearance in 1575 and joined established social rituals, while nicotine added a new sensory dimension to betel quid chewing. Cacao was cultivated from the mid 17th century Spanish Catholic clergy popularized, popularized its consumption as a hot drink. Hispanic food came to be associated with wealthy urbanized lifestyles. The use of beef and cured pork meat, heavy on the stomach and rich in taste, contrasted with the native fare of fish and braised vegetables and demanded new cooking methods, sotoing, guisar, and frying in oils, prito. Sourness, the defining flavor of lowland Christianized Filipino cuisine was enhanced with chili peppers. Chili became known to the Chinese from about 1671, in all probability through trade with the Philippines, where five different species were collectively known by the vernacular term buyo buyo. The impact of the galleon trade on Manila was profoundly transformative. The influx of worldly goods to consumption habits to new heights and fueled conspicuous consumption on a massive scale. Bodies were clothed in fine, costly fabrics. New fragrances introduced olfactory experiences and an air of worldly glamour. With the introduction of new world plant crops and animals, culinary as well as geographic landscapes were irrevocably altered. 
A taste for rich foods was engendered. Communities far removed from the urban milieu of the galleon trade responded to a manifold increase in the range and variety of Chinese trade ceramics. Manila, in sum, was one of the world's most spectacular emporium with cosmopolitan sensibilities and a truly global outlook. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, our next speak speaker, uh, Dr. Florina Capistrano Baker, is a consultant and the former director of the Ayala Museum uh, in the Philippines. She earned her PhD at Columbia University, New York. Uh, her edited volume, Trans-Pacific Engagements, Trade, Translation, and Visual Culture of Entangled Empires, 1565 to 1898, uh, will be coming out next year, I think. <laughs> Um, Dr. Capistrano Baker will guide us as we trace the reverberations of the galleon trade far beyond Manila uh, to the other port cities of Asia. Florina. Oh, good evening um, and good morning from New York. I'd like to share my screen. I wanted to make sure that I stayed within the um, 10 minute limit. So thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak in celebration of the 10th anniversary of the Pacific Alliance. The title of my talk is Trans-Pacific Connections, 19th Century Manila as Nexus of Global Trade. Discussions of early globalization naturally pivot on the galleon trade between Manila and Acapulco, when trade goods, raw materials, and luxury items circulated among cult connected cultures in Asia, the Americas, and Europe. I would like to call attention to another trade network that intersected with and continued after the last Spanish galleons sailed between Manila and Acapulco. I refer to the lesser known trade between Manila and Salem, Massachusetts. Like the galleon trade, commerce between Manila and the early American Republic connected the Western world to Asian ports, but with notable differences. Spanish attempts to trade directly with China, for example, were largely unsuccessful, so that Spanish access to Chinese goods were primarily through transshipments in Manila. American merchants, in contrast, regularly traded directly with China after stopping in Manila. My goal is to illuminate commercial rivalries that complicated the Spanish enterprise in the Pacific and to illustrate the intertwined lives of merchants, artists, and artworks, in particular watercolors known as Letras y Figuras and Tipos del País. Though the Manila-Salem trade initially overlapped with the Manila galleons, what distinguished it was a shift in Manila's role from an entrepot primarily transshipping imported goods to a major supplier of local products. In this new role, fluctuating prices impacted Manila and other parts of the archipelago where sugar, abaca, cotton, coffee, and indigo were cultivated and harvested. Both men and women engaged in this trans-Pacific enterprise, but it's noteworthy that women controlled much of the abaca trade in Bicol, where buyers and sellers were almost exclusively women. And it would be interesting to compare this with the principal actors in the Manila galleon trade. By the 1820s, two merchant houses founded by Massachusetts merchants were firmly established in Manila, their headquarters and warehouses by the Pasig River. On the left, Peel, Hubble and Company focused on Manila hemp. On the right, Russell and Sturgis at its zenith was regarded as the greatest company of any country. Beyond trading in commodities, merchants acquired luxury goods and artworks affirming their success. These include souvenir watercolors called letras y figuras, which spell a patron's name using intertwined human figures that form letters of the alphabet. This example, spelling the name William P. Pierce, is attributed to the foremost practitioner of this genre, Jose Honorato Lozano. The central location of a warehouse displaying the U.S. flag hints at the patron's nationality and occupation. While studying business correspondence from the merchant house Russell and Sturgis, I came upon letters signed by W.P. Pierce, likely the same individual who commissioned this watercolor. Records also identify Pierce as the U.S. consul in Spanish-controlled Manila from 1854 to 1855. 
business documents allow us to reconstruct the volume and scope of this early trade. In 1852, for example, two to three American ships docked in Manila every month, so about 80 ships a year. Records of exports note fluctuating prices of Manila hemp, sugar, and indigo, mostly from Ilocos. Foreign exports in 1850 list sugar, hemp, indigo, cordage, coffee, grass cloth, sap and wood, animal hides exported to Europe, the U.S., Australia, California, and Bombay. Others list rice, tobacco, cigars, molasses, ebony, beche de mer for making soups, and additional destinations including France and Shanghai, Singapore, and Batavia, or present-day Jakarta. Another watercolor attributed to Lozano is the Charles D. Mugford, with clusters of Chinese traders spelling the first name Charles, while Filipino figures spell the surname Mugford below. Vignettes frame the middle initial D, including a man carrying the U.S. flag and a large roll of hemp cordage on the left. A search through Massachusetts records reveals that the historical Charles Mugford was born in 1809 and sailed as captain of the merchant ship Ariatus to China, Indonesia, and the Philippines. More significantly, Mugford and Oliver Keating were co-founders of the Philippines' first steam-powered rope factory, the Santa Mesa Rope Factory. Although the Spanish were familiar with Manila hemp, they did not recognize its commercial potential. Besides machine-made Manila hemp cordage, American papermakers invented Manila paper in the 1830s by recycling Manila hemp cordage previously used on ships as paper pulp. Manila folders and envelopes were also originally made with Manila hemp, hence the dark color. Figures portrayed in Letras y Figuras derive from a related genre called Tipos del País, or country types, depicting local inhabitants, attire, and occupation, such as this Tipos del País album painted and signed by Filipino artist Damian Domingo, circa 1820s in the Newberry Library in Chicago. Likely generated by the galleon trade, tipos del país are not unique to the Philippines, for there's a related tradition in Latin America called costumbrismo, depicting local folklore, including social types or tipos and genre scenes. On the right, a watercolor by Peruvian artist Pancho Fierro depicts the popular tapada, a fully covered woman exposing only one eye, creating a sense of mystery. Peruvian tipos circulated widely, helping to create a sense of national identity. Similarly, in Mexico, costumbrismo helped in the process of self-definition after independence from Spain in 1821. In the Philippines, tipos continue to play a key role in retrieving identity. My research on tipos del país attributed to Damian Domingo demonstrates that to date there is only one known album that can be definitively attributed to Domingo on the left. I have determined that other known surviving albums, all painted on pith paper and unsigned, are Chinese copies on the right. You'll note these examples uh, are clearly by different hands. The body proportions and facial types and details differ, such as the shawl, textile designs, and slippers that are plain black on the left and embroidered Chinese on the right. Chinese copies of Philippine originals is a previously unknown phenomenon and one that is clearly related to global trade and specifically associated with the Manila New England trade. Providing additional evidence of this hitherto unknown phenomenon is a master album with a stamp of the well-known Cantonese painter Ting Gua, also known as Guan Lian Chang, dated 1854. Bound in this master album are Chinese images for apprentices to copy, such as on the right. Interspersed within the album are two copies of works by Justiniano Asuncion, providing empirical evidence of this previously undocumented phenomenon of Cantonese artists replicating Philippine works. Differences in style are seen more clearly when we view the Philippine originals and Chinese copies side by side. On the left is a Spanish mestiza by Asuncion in the New York Public Library. On the right is a Chinese work clearly copied from Tinkwa's master album. 
Chinese copies and Philippine originals appear to have circulated within the same Manila New England trade network. It is noteworthy that Chinese copies mostly survive in U.S. and British collections. As mentioned above, while Spanish galleons accessed Chinese goods primarily through Manila, U.S. ships traded directly with China, bringing Philippine goods from Manila to Canton, including Manila-made luxury items such as Tipo Sel Pais that were evidently replicated in Cantonese studios to satisfy overseas demand. After the last Spanish galleons crisscrossed the Pacific, the Manila Salem trade continued to supply the world with Manila hemp, sugar, indigo, embroidered textiles, and artworks, expanding the Philippines' role in a globalizing world. In closing, I'd like to share this exciting new volume on the visual culture of trans-Pacific trade, soon available at Ayala Museum, uh, published by, with the uh, Getty Research Institute, Coast Historisches Institute in Florence, and with online previews available now on Google Books. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to apologize once again for our technical difficulties. Um, apologize to the audience as well as to Florina. Um, because unfortunately we missed a few of some, uh, some really beautiful images, um, but at least we were able to uh, show you the, the bulk of the presentation afterwards. Our fourth speaker is Mr. Clement On, Deputy Cur Curator of Curatorial and Research and Principal Curator of Asian Export Art and Peranakan at the Asian Civilization Museum here in Singapore. He's curated exhibits such as Port Cities, Multicultural Emporiums of Asia, 1500 to 1900, as well as uh, Life in Edo, Russell Wong and Kyoto, which I, I was fortunate to see a couple of weeks ago um, before it closed. So Clement will introduce us to some of the material culture of the galleon trade. So please go ahead. Thanks, Matt. Um, sorry, could I trouble um, Cole for the slides? Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for having me here today, and it's good to see everyone virtually. A special thanks to the organizer, Yale and US College, for providing such a wonderful uh, platform. And I would like to extend my gratitude of thanks to the ambassadors um, to and to the embassies, the embassies of Mexico, Peru, and the Philippines, for their constant warm support uh, to the work that we do at the Asian Civilization Museum, ACM, at Singapore, in Singapore. Um, we have heard from the previous panelists of the many riches, uh, bountiful resources from the Philippines, Mexico. Perhaps we haven't dwelled so much into Peru yet, but again, it's another rich, resourceful place and part, all of these uh, places are part of the, this Manila Acapulco galleon trade. Um, the trade network and its many routes has facilitated the circulations of goods, people and ideas. And these clearly come across in many of the works uh, that we see today that have survived. So call it whatever you want, Asian export art, cross-cultural art, or art of this global interchange. Well, these works are, these works are the exact testimonies of this great trans-Pacific interchange. As each of us have only 10 minutes, I would like to share about an object at the ACM. Next, please. Um, here you see a, a type of portable furniture that is commonly seen and made in Asia for export to Europe. And for in this case, uh, also been exported to the Americas or Spanish related markets. Uh, it is what we call a forefront cabinet or some scholars would prefer to call them as writing boxes, portable writing boxes. The form itself is based on a European model. Um, the hinge front, where you see on the image of the, on the left, uh, with a sort of estrogen lock at the center, uh, top center, um, upon unlocking, sort of drops down to form a surface for writing, as you can see on the image on the right. Um, the many drawers, uh, some with even have individual locks, give access to what was kept, such as documents, writing implements, paper, uh, or even uh, valuable items, such as jewelry as well. Next, please. Um, other known examples of forefront cabinets uh, made in the Philippines are relatively rare. And to my best knowledge, in terms of published examples, uh, these are the two perhaps much more well-known pieces in the Ferdinando and Catherine Zubel, the Ayala collection. 
uh, in uh, Makati City. Both are rather similar, as you can see from the images. Uh, they have the very similar type of bone inlay technique uh, using different types of exotic, of exotic roots. Um, the, the motifs you can see on the four corner, the, the sort of um, floral motifs are again very similar uh, to the one at the ACM. Um, nonetheless, the interiors, um, as one of the examples has shown, uh, the interiors drawers is plain, is without decoration. Um, but again, these are types of uh, traveling desk, writing boxes, or chests uh, that are seen commonly circulated, made in the Philippines, and then were exported out to um, the Americas or, or to European markets. Next, please. Again, other examples that we have uh, uh, been able to locate are in the collection of the uh, Franz Mayer Museum. Here you see uh, the image on the left is a traveling chest, again, possessing that similar type of um, um, uh, floral motifs on each of the four corners. Um, again, bone inlay decoration, um, probably made in the Philippines. And what is unusual about this particular traveling chest is um, unlike those writing boxes, these chests sometimes could go up to uh, one meter or, or 1.5 meters long, perhaps meant to store uh, clothes or other types of commodities that were part of these uh, uh, international uh, global trade. And what is interesting is, as you can see from the, the lock at the bottom, there is also a coat of arms um, that is identified to a, a Spanish or a, a, a one of the clients in New Spain in Mexico, uh, uh, one of those um, uh, Spanish families as well, uh, which is very interesting. And, and the image on the right shows another traveling chest, again, this time lacking of bone and lace, but we don't exactly know for sure if this was made in the Philippines. Uh, it could also have been um, um, uh, made in the uh, Mexico during the 18th century or even early 19th century period. But it the best, very similar design, again, what we see on the four corners of the bone inlays, uh, the floral, abstract floral motifs, and even the patterns, the geometric patterns that you see, the, the sort of diamond logens patterns all around the borders of the of the, uh, the cabinet. Again, you see that kind of motifs and patterns uh, also reflecting in other types of, um, of furniture and to even textiles, um, um, part of this whole uh, galleon trade. Next, please. Um, I would like to draw your attention back to the cabinet at the ACM. Uh, here are some of the details of the drawers and four shape uh, feet at the four corners of the, uh, the this um, cabinet. Uh, we have already said that the forefront cabinet is European uh, inspired, European in form, uh, but it was made in the Philippines with exotic woods, bone inlay, those white parts are the bone inlay, and silver fittings, um, which of course now have darkened and tarnished. Um, the lion heads, as you can see on the image on the right, the lion heads and paw shaped feet uh, at the corners. Uh, and from the drawers, what you see are sort of lion or dog uh, heads, uh, jaw pools, uh, are also commonly seen in Chinese furniture. Um, so, you know, this could also be a work uh, executed by southern Chinese craftsmen who were based in Manila uh, at that point in time, or perhaps even local uh, Filipino craftsmen or artisans who were also influenced by that type of uh, furniture, which uh, uh, were also very popular back in those days. Um, nonetheless, you know, we also have to note that lion or dog heads, um, sprouting paw-shaped feet uh, in furniture are also commonly seen in European uh, uh, decors and interiors uh, since the Renaissance period. And this design continues to appear in later periods as well in Europe. And all this sort of, you know, um, mixture, um, which makes this furniture very interesting and engaging with its many cross-cultural elements. Next, please. Well, the most interesting aspect in um, the uh, writing box at the ACM is the inlay decoration on the central panel uh, of the interior of the forefronts. Um, you, will note, you will notice, as you can see from this image, that it's showing the foundation myth of Tetno Chitlan, 
uh, the capital city of Mexico, or more commonly known uh, as Aztec. After independence, this became the coat of arms of Mexico. Uh, in the center, as you can see uh, from the, the image, there is a proud eagle devouring a snake while perched on a nopal flowering cactus, um, representing the island of Tenochtitlan, uh, which grows on a rock on top of an Aztec glint for water. Uh, on the left, there is a depiction of a noble man or king, uh, sort of a king-like figure, pointing towards the eagle, wearing a, wearing a seemingly typical Aztec costume, one of those that we see very commonly again in the illustrations of uh, those uh, codex manuscripts. Uh, on the right, there is another figure uh, holding a necklace, uh, sort of in the sign of offering to the eagle. Um, and, and on her other arm, um, she's holding a, a, a sort of a, a flower, sort of a flower that sprung up um, uh, uh, towards the, the upper top corner, uh, right corner. Um, what is really interesting is that both figures unidentified seems to suggest that they are probably uh, uh, figures of importance, great importance, perhaps noble figures, uh, symbolizing even perhaps the founders of the new capital city of Tenochtitlan. Um, and not to forget that female figures or depiction of female figures are considerably rare and usually absent in uh, Aztec iconography. Uh, the original Mexica legend tells us about how uh, the patron god, the god of sun and war, instructed the Aztec to migrate unto the encounter an eagle on a cactus growing within the lake. Uh, following the instructions, um, uh, the king let his people uh, depart from the original uh, place of origin in Atlan and journeyed until they saw this vision. Uh, at which the location which ultimately founded Tenochtitlan on the lakes of uh, Texcoco. Uh, it is extremely unusual to, again, to find Aztec imagery on the European style forefront cabinet made in the Philippines with some Chinese inspiration in terms of its furniture work. Um, this object uh, it's, uh, could be a special commission uh, from Mexico City, or perhaps was made as a gift uh, for a high-ranking official in the uh, Spanish route, Mexico, uh, Mexico debt, the vice royalty of New Spain. Um, it's an important testimony of this transcultural uh, nature of the Manila Acapulco galleon trade. This object is currently on display at uh, the Asian Civilization Museum's Marine Time Trade Gallery uh, at the first floor. So, you know, um, I welcome everyone uh, who are able, who are in Singapore and those who are able to come to Singapore to see this uh, piece at the museum. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much um, to all four panelists. Um, from Dr. Viamar's big picture introduction to the patterns and structures of the galleon trade, to Dr. Reyes' rich analysis of the trade's impact on Manila, and from Dr. Capistrano Baker's tour of the myriad influences of the trade uh, far beyond Manila, um, to Mr. On's close examination of its material culture. Um, I think now we have a, a much better understanding, not just of the politics and economics of the galleon trade, but as material and cultural impacts as well. Um, so I'd like to give the audience a chance to have some of their questions heard as well. Um, we don't have a lot of time, but I'd like to, um, to pose some of them to this panel. Um, and any of you may uh, jump in with uh, answers or comments as, as you like. Um, there's one or two questions about uh, suggesting that perhaps this, uh, this interconnectedness was problematic in some ways, um, that in some, there, there may have been uh, competitions over trade. Um, one question mentions uh, the proliferation of Asian goods in the Americas, which may have competed with goods from Europe. Um, and I think I also read somewhere that there was uh, limit, limits on the galleons, that, there, that they didn't want to have too many of them uh, crossing the Pacific. So I was wondering uh, what you would have to say about um, the possible risks or the possible uh, concerns that authorities might have had about uh, the connectedness of the trade. I would like to answer this question um, because we must have in mind that the Manila Galleon had some rules, regulation, uh, capacity of the Galleon, this is a specific, 
and who can participate in the gallium. All these rules and regulations started in 1593. So really at the beginning of the system and the participation of different groups of merchants, networks of merchants, including Portuguese, including uh, different forces that uh, established by negotiation this type of regulation. Simultaneously in America, and particularly in Mexico, it was created the guild, the so-called Consulado de Mexico, that is the meeting of merchants, most of them Mexicans, but also Europeans, Spaniards, dealing from Mexico uh, with the system uh, all the way to Manila. And they have representatives in Manila. So this type of, of cooperative organization, that is a network, uh, guarantee certain agreements of the type of products, of the volume, the value, um, there were groups that cheat about this, but in reality, it was always a type of negotiation across the Pacific and also the Atlantic. This is it. Oh, Sorina? I also think that um, in specific, uh, with regards to sp specific products, um, there were attempts to control the types of products and the amount of um, exports from Asia that would affect uh, certain industries in Europe, for example. And I'm thinking of the textile, uh, the silk industry, uh, where um, in Spain, for example, uh, they're trying to protect uh, the, the silk industry in Spain when it started. Uh, and there were, I believe, prohibitions from uh, imposed on Mexico. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Villamar. Uh, so there were certain uh, attempts to control specific industries, uh, specifically to, to protect the European um, counterparts. And there were also, as in many colonized um, uh, countries, uh, usually the colonizers would try to imitate the handmade, I'm using again the example of textiles, they would um, attempt to uh, create machine made versions of the handmade textiles, and therefore eventually kill off the, uh, the, the handmade industries with these cheaper machine made uh, in exports from, from Europe. So this was happening also uh, with uh, both the Manila galleon trade and the uh, Salem, Manila Salem trade where the American factories in, in Lowell, Massachusetts, for example, would try to sell their um, American made, um, machine made uh, cloths and try to sell them in China or the Philippines. But the Chinese didn't really want these cloths because they had specific measurements that they wanted for their, you know, for specific um, um, uh, clothing that they were going to manufacture. So it's interesting when you see, when you read through the correspondence of the uh, of the business letters, how oh they they exported these cloths and the Filipinos didn't want them, the Chinese didn't want them, and they have to get back on the ship and they have to bring them back to the U.S. and back to uh, to New York to try to unload this. So there was a lot of that going on. Uh, yes, please, Raquel. Uh, you're muted. Yes, just to pick up on um, um, Professor Villamar's point on the, the rules and the regulations. Um, interestingly, uh, uh, a lot of a lot of those rules and regulations um, were circumvented through um, the country trade, for, in, for instance. Um, the Spaniards, the, 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 Span the Spanish authorities were, were, were desperate to keep their rivals out of this trade. Um, the Dutch and the English in particular, um, but uh, the, the trade became very much a free for all, um, and and Spanish authorities in Manila would often turn a blind eye 
to um, uh, 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 ships that came through, sometimes bearing Armenian flags, but crewed by Europeans. So everyone, everyone wanted a piece of this trade, and it was always rife with um, corruption and underhand dealings. So despite those, despite those regulations, there were always ways to circumvent them. Thank you. Um, another theme that was uh, that we advertised when we advertised this panel was about globalization. Um, and as an early modern historian myself, I kind of hesitate to apply terms like globalization, which seems so contemporary to this time period that we're talking about. But on the other hand, um, you know, Dr. Reyes, for example, talked about the cosmopolitanism of the 16th to 18th centuries. Um, and many of us touched on the, the way in which the world was seemed increasingly connected in this period. So I'm wondering um, whether, whether you see this uh, period and the galleon trade especially as a moment of uh, globalization. Is it, um, is, it, is it fair to use that kind of term? Uh, and, and, what, and how does it help us analyze the past or not? I think it really depends on um, your definition of globalization, because clearly um, uh, before the uh, Spanish galleons, clearly there was trade going on uh, with, a, with a Silk Road, with a maritime Silk Roads, with the Indian Ocean and South China Sea networks. But it was only with, um, with the initiation of the galleon trade that you get to see these various uh, smaller regional trade networks kind of stretched all the way across um, the Indian Ocean, South China Sea to the Pacific and all the way across to the Atlantic. Um, so again, I would say that, that that is a globalization, but again, I'm not an economist, so I wouldn't know what, what, is the, what is the definition, the real definition of globalization. But this is really the first time in the world where you have um, uh, the entire, you know, Asia and Latin America, North America and Europe all connected and where all these um, ideas and concepts and objects and people are moving all around the globe and in engaging with each other and impacting each other's cultures so that in the modern world you have these very um, hybrid hybridized cultures um, that I guess are more the beginnings that show the beginnings of our world as we know it today, where we're closely intertwined with each other. Thank you. Anyone else want to speak to that? Um, Matt, yeah, I would just like to add on to Nina's point as well. And I really echo what she just said. It's really depending on how we, we defined in, in, in what sense and what terms of what we call globalization. Um, but speaking about, you know, if you look at Manila, well, Philippines, Manila, and then if you look at uh, port cities such as uh, Acapulco, or Veracruz, uh, all filtering, of course, into Pueb cities like Puebla and Mexico City, these places, these cities are also great emporiums of different sort of goods that, that comes in. And then in the Philippines, even before uh, the goods actually export were exported out across the Pacific Ocean, they were assembled and you can see already from various inventories that there are goods that comes from China that were amassed in the Philippines from the regions across Southeast Asia as well that were accumulated there. And then not to mention as far as India as well, again, you know, uh, it's all very complicated uh, in, in that sense. But, but you see a, a different sort of variety of people working and settling in all these uh, different port cities. Uh, eventually, most of them, some of them also settled down uh, as part of the local population as well. Um, so, 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 yeah, it's kind of a yes and no uh, to, to, to back to your question in, in a way. Thank you. Um, one, one final question is, did, did everyday people in places like Manila and uh, Acapulco, did they feel connected to each other uh, across the Pacific? 
did they share, did they come to share certain identities or um, feelings of belonging in the same, you know, same religion, same um, realm? Um, to what extent did that go beyond the elites? Does anyone have any thoughts about that? Yes, Quatimo. Yeah, uh, I think one of the characteristics precisely of the moment of the um, Spanish uh, monarchy is that at least in terms of proposal, it was overarching, not only the European culture, but also the, uh, what we call now Latin American and parts of Asia. So it's an imaginary absorption of different parts of this huge empire, the largest in the time. And they, it has certain elements that are specific of what we call also globalization. One is mobility, something that didn't happen that proportion before. So people from different places of the planet moving to different places for military purpose, missionaries, um, workers, uh, slaves even from the India all the way to Mexico or Africa to, to Mexico. This is one characteristic. The other is how Clement mentioned these cosmopolitan cities. It's a flourishing of ports that existed, already existed in, in Southeast Asia before the Spaniards of the Europeans, but that pop up in different parts of the um, Hispanic empire. And this is another important characteristic. And mention, what you mentioned in terms of the um, a religion that tried to, to be uniform for everybody. However, we, uh, it developed in different forms. And now we have, we are celebrating in Mexico, the day of the dead that is a mix between the indigenous culture and the Catholic religion. And it, John, just one uh, element to precision. Indeed, it was um, an, uh, an structure, a framework of regulations and people over, uh, always uh, find ways to to avoid this regulation. However, the system produced so much in terms of richness, value, that in, indeed um, many people gain something in the different parts of this, this empire. Uh, certainly China won a lot from that, that trade, Southeast Asia and Europe and the, the American uh, uh, vice royalties. Any final words from the panel? I think it's um, following up on um, Dr. Villamar's comments and your question about whether people uh, felt connected to each other. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a little bit difficult uh, kind of going back into the minds of um, individuals at the time. Of course, you can try to recreate that through the colonial accounts. But um, I think perhaps one question to ask would be, uh, how do we feel connected today? Um, what do we feel when we visit these other cultures? Because uh, specifically uh, in the case of the Philippines, um, if you look at the pre-colonial culture, we were very closely aligned culturally with the rest of Southeast Asia before the coming of the Spaniards. And this is very, um, this is evident in the pre-colonial material that's recently come to light with the um, uh, probable connections with the Hindu Buddhist culture uh, before Westernization. So, but with the arrival of the Spanish, this, huge, this uh, 250 year connection with Mexico, um, I think this had a, a very transformative uh, uh, effect on our culture so that I think uh, Filipino culture in general has become more closely aligned actually with Latin America across the Pacific. And um, so it's kind of this, this hybrid 
culture where we're, we're Asian, but at the same time, we feel, feel this affinity with Latin America. And when we go to Mexico, it's, it's almost like coming home. I mean, you see the built environment looks very much like Manila. The, the cultures are very much like the Philippines and the cuisine is very close to our cuisine. And so they're, they're you know, we feel very close. Uh, uh, it, it, as I said, it's, it's like coming home. I think more than if we were to go to Japan or to Thailand, which is closer to us. But uh, in terms of cultural affinities, we feel closer to this other cultures. We see the Parian in Puebla and you know, we have the Parian in the Philippines, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's just so many parallels. Maybe this is a great way to uh, end our session, <laughs> our Q&A session with the panelists. I just want to thank all four of you for um, joining us and presenting today and also for fielding so many questions from our audience. Um, we're also lucky that the embassies of Mexico, Peru, and the Philippines here in Singapore have collaborated with Yale and U.S. College to produce today's program. Um, so to formally conclude, I'd like to invite each ambassador to offer some short concluding remarks. Um, so to begin, um, I'd like to, uh, if he's here, I'd like to ask His Excellency Agustin Garcia Lopez Loeza, Ambassador of Mexico, to say a few words. Que tal, buenas noches. Hello, how are you? Well, I would like to thank you so much, Mr. Reader. Uh, uh, I would like to thank the speakers, Gautamo Villamar, Florina Caspitrano Baker. Raquel Reyes and Clement On, my dear friend. And I, I would like to like also to thank uh, Yale NUS College, Dr. Tricia Craig, thank you enormously, Dr. Matthew Reeder, thank you, and Eduardo Lage for partnering with the embassies, of course, as we have said, of Peru, Embajador Carlos Vázquez, Embajador Joseph Del Mar Yap of the Philippines to organize this webinar. As you know, this comes with the 10th anniversary of the Pacific Alliance, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and Peru, and the fact that in December of 2021, Singapore will become the first associate state of the Pacific Alliance. This is very important because the Pacific Alliance itself was made 10 years ago to have a trade alliance and also further than trade, an integration between the countries of the Americas, of Latin America, who are in the Pacific Basin itself. And one of the goals was precisely to link better, not only with Latin America, with North America, but mainly with the Pacific itself. So the fact that we have 60 countries, which are countries are observer countries, from those, there are New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and later Ecuador and South Korea that want to be the states that will associate with us, associate states. But it is wonderful that the first associate state, the one that we have already finished the negotiations, will be precisely Singapore because of the fact that this Pacific Alliance will be not only on the American rim, but we will have the Asian link. So this is exactly what is important. When you see your future, you have to see your past. And even though Mexico and, 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 and the Pacific Alliance countries, and the, of course the Asian countries were almost antipodes. It will do, it will, will do a haul from here. Maybe I will be arriving to my house in Mexico City because of the fact that we are on the two extremes of the world. And which is amazing that when I came here as an ambassador to Singapore, it seems that we were very far away. But as a matter of fact, we are so close because of the fact that we have this common history. And I agree with Florina Capistrano Baker in the sense that there is so much commonalities when you go to Philippines or Mexico and people forget that since the, you know, it is like the, the governor of India was the one that administered Southeast Asia. In the case of Mexico, Mexico was the vice royalty of 
Spain, and it was called New Spain, and it is Mexico that administered the Philippines. So the Viceroy of Mexico administered the governor of Philippines. So that is why there is so much closeness. When we talk about Spaniards living in Philippines, many of them were really new Spaniards or even Mexicans because of the fact that, that you see the Tagalog or you see the food, uh, adobo, for example, those are Mexican thing, and, and it's not only Spanish that Tagalog has, of course, um, Asian words, but it, they also have Spanish words, but also Aztec words. So in that sense, there is, there is this commonality between us. And I do agree with the fact that you have an Euro-Asian continent, a very big continent, and the only enormous continent which is not connected at all, it is the American continent. And we were first connected by, by the Atlantic, and thanks to the Manila Galleon, we were connected by the Pacific. So it is the first time that the whole world was connected. Everybody talks about the Silk Road, and China is, is you know, they, 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 they like to tell the story, but I think they would have to tell the other story, the other side of the silver coin. And that side of the silver coin is precisely the Pacific side. And the fact that we have globalized the world by having this 250 years uh, trade that made it so that we had, as it is said, changes of markets, changes of the way that we eat, of the way that we lived, of our gastronomy, of our culture. And this transculturalization was extremely rich and amazing. Many of the things that you have, have here, that you eat regularly, chiles, avocados, tomatoes, so on, come from Mexico. Mango, it's called mango, the manila in Mexico. So all of our patterns have been changed because of this fantastic trade between, between you know, Asia and, 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 and the Americas. So in that sense, now we are, we are trying to get back to this wonderful transculturalization, to this open trade, to recognize them ourselves as being together and connected. And that's why it is so important to have had this seminar. And I just end by saying that today is 20, it, it's 2021, where 200 years for 1821, our independence, and 500 years from the conquest, the fall of the Aztec Empire, and exactly 700 years of the, uh, the, the, the Tenochtitlan Mexico Foundation, which was very well explained by Dr. Clement Ohm, and that you can see at the museum. So, so, so this is the kind of connection that now in the, in the, in the, in the, in the museum you have the, in the Asia Civilization Museum, you have this fantastic myth of Tenochtitlan who became the flag of Mexico. So this is the kind of connection that we're following. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, next, I'd like to invite His Excellency Carlos Vasquez, Ambassador of Peru, uh, to share some thoughts. Um, first of all, uh, like my friend, the Ambassador of Mexico, Agustin Garcia mentioned, I would like to express my deep appreciation to Yale and US College of Singapore the brilliant panelists that are participating in this webinar, and my dear colleagues, of course, the ambassadors of Mexico and the Philippines for joining efforts to make possible this captivating event that has given us enlightening insights on the relevance of the Manila Galleon as one of the earliest expressions of globalization. Although a holistic approach is highly advisable to understand the complexity and significance of this seminal maritime route, let me make some brief remarks on the role played by Peru as one of the main gears of this cross-regional trade machinery. First, with the discovery of the silver mines of Potosí in the middle of the 16th century, Peru became the largest producer of silver in the Americas. 
In accordance with the Peruvian historian Margarita Suarez, between 1580 and 1670, the Viceroyalty of Peru produced 65% of all the silver in the Americas and 55% in the world. This prominent position coincided since the end of the 16th century with the increasing demand of silver from China and the high price paid by the Chinese merchants, becoming Peru the first supplier of silver minted coins to Asia. There are no reliable record records of American silver used in the Manila Galleon circuit, but some researchers estimate that 2 million of Peruvian pesos from Potosi were annually sent to Manila through Acapulco all along the 17th century. Gradually, last half of 17th century, Peru's silver production decreased and Mexican production rose. Second, as some historians have demonstrated during the last decades of the 16th century, due to the interest of some uh, Filipino businessmen and authorities, including even the, the governor of Manila at that time, Gonzalo Ronquillo, and some Peruvian merchants, efforts were made in the decade, in the decade of 1580 to establish a direct maritime route between the Viceroyalty of Peru and the Philippines. Unfortunately, these initiatives were banned since the end of the 16th century because the Spanish authorities considered this direct route could divert silver resources to Asia in detriment of the, uh, uh, of the Spanish monarchy. Third, in spite of this ban, Asian products, mainly Chinese silk, was imported illegally, circumventing the law, from Mexico by some merchants of the Viceroyalty of Peru due to its high demand in Lima and other Peruvian towns. So the connection between Mexico and Peru remained very intense. The American historian and diplomat William Little Church published an article one time ago that proved the extens extensive use of silver garments and porcelain from China by most wealthy members of the Peruvian elite in the 17th century. But Peru not only exported silver coins to Asia, of course, but also, as Dr. Villamar mentioned, samples and seeds of agricultural products such as potatoes and sweet potatoes that modify the diet of the Asian populations, representing one of the most interesting economic and cultural cross-fertilization examples of global history, as it was underscored by the, all the panelists, particularly Raquel Reyes, Florina Capistrano, and Clement On. Fourth, even now, as the start of the 21st century, Peru exports mainly minerals and food to Asian countries, which demonstrates my country has had, historically speaking, real comparative advantages in the production of these goods. Although now it's engaged in the process of adding value to its products through innovation, for example, in food industry and the incorporation of its enterprises into regional and global value chains in the context of the current process of globalization. And fifth, in spite of the dramatic changes imposed by history in the last 500 years, the fascinating experience of the Manila Galleon as one of the forerunners of the current globalization reverberates in our imagination and reveals that connection and connections and mutual influence between Latin America and Asia are much more fruitful and older than expected. The free trade agreement between the Pacific Alliance and Singapore opens a new promising chapter to reinforce even more our links in the era of the fourth industrial revolution and to sail again the uncharted waters of the 21st century's Manila Galleon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Um, finally, I'd like to ask His Excellency Joseph Del Moria, Ambassador of the Philippines, to offer uh, some final, final remarks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the very distinguished uh, panelists uh, uh, and, uh, and Yale NUS College for making this uh, webinar possible. I hope that uh, the participants, uh, uh, the audience learn uh, as much as I did from uh, listening to this webinar today, attending this webinar. Um, I just want to um, say a few words about um, this year, the Philippines is marking uh, the 500th anniversary of our country's role in Magellan's 
uh, circumnavigation uh, voyages. So, in fact, earlier it was shown that uh, the Philippine National Quincentennial Committee has prepared activities. So, I invite everybody to to go to the site and see what are the virtual events that, that we have done in, in celebration of this uh, event. But in 1521, the expedition of Ferdinand Magellan or Fernando Magallanes accidentally arrived in the Philippines. He promptly claimed the Philippines for the Spanish crown. Unfortunately, Magallanes got himself killed in the island of Mactan when he intervened in a quarrel between two local chieftains. The rest of his crew then left, and uh, eventually one of his uh, one of the five ships that set set out from Spain, the Victoria, uh, survived and eventually returned to Europe. Uh, the voyage was done very much. Uh, as part of the goal at that time of looking for another alternative commercial route to the uh, Spice uh, Islands at that, at that time. But after Magellan's voyage, the Spanish crown sent five additional expeditions to the Philippines. Um, and only two of them arrived in the Philippines. Uh, the first, uh, the first one that arrived uh, was the one of Villalobos. It arrived in 1543, but it didn't stay long in the Philippines. It got into a lot of trouble. Uh, but his claim to fame is that he named the Philippines Filipinas after Prince Philip II at that time, the Crown Prince. So that's when the Philippines became known as Filipinas. Yeah, the last voyage that arrived was led by Miguel Lopez de Legazpi, who left New Spain, Mexico. Actually, all of the five voyages left from New Spain or Mexico. Uh, de Gaspe left in 1564. And uh, when he arrived in the Philippines, he was successful, this time in colonizing the Philippines. So he stayed and he colonized the Philippines initially in Cebu, established his uh, capital, and then eventually moved to Manila. Uh, and it was today's, uh, when we say that the Manila Acapulco trade started in 1564, that was really that voyage of his when he left Mexico to come to the Philippines. And then the round trip, the return trip, which uh, Dr. Villemar mentioned earlier was the Tornaviaje, which is when they figure out a way to go back uh, east, sailing eastwards back to uh, Mexico. And that was when then the, uh, the voyages were completed and then the trade route for the Manila Acapulco uh, galleon trade uh, was firmly established. As our speakers have explained to us tonight, the 250 year old galleon trade between the Philippines and Mexico did not just exchange goods, but more importantly, brought about the change and enrichment in the economies and cultures between Asia and the Americas. So it was truly a, the start of glo globalization of trade, but more importantly, it was also the cross fertilization of ideas and cultures. It is a perfect exemplification of the mutual gains that can be derived from the globalization of trade for mutual benefit. And this is a lesson that I think is just as relevant today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all three ambassadors um, for their final comments. And I'd like to invite uh, Trisha Craig um, to, to conclude our program. Thank you so much. Uh, so I want to thank our panelists, our moderator, the ambassadors and all of you in the audience for an incredible conversation and discussion. Um, as I think you probably know, we had a lot more questions than we had time for. Um, and I'm really appreciative of um, just how much enthusiasm uh, amongst their, the audience there, there was for this uh, terrific conversation. I hope you will join us throughout this academic year for more interesting and thought provoking sessions like the one tonight. To make sure you don't miss anything, please use the link in the chat to sign up for our mailing list and we look forward to seeing you again. Good night.